Good evening and welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting. May I have a motion to go into closed session? Uh, pursuant to the general provision, Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move we go into closed session to consider matters that relate to negotiations to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this pu public body has jurisdiction to perform an administrative function and to consult with counsel. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. We will return at 6 p.m. Gentlemen, welcome to the Board of Education meeting. This is a public meeting that is being videotaped for county citizens to review on QAC TV, Channel 7, a local cable station. The agenda is available on the information table. During this meeting, we ask that you turn off your cell phones and hold personal conversations outside of the meeting room. We will now stand and be led by the Pledge of Allegiance by our student board members. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone. At this time, we're going to move to the approval of the agenda. So motion to approve the agenda. I move that we approve the agenda. Uh, there be a, amend the agenda to remove section 6 02, section 6 03, section 6 004 from the agenda, and to also amend the agenda to go into closed session following this meeting. Second it. All in favor say aye. Discussion, aye. Discussion. Oh. I was oh. wondering why we're removing those items. Um, I had sent everyone an email this afternoon. Did you not get it? I did not. Okay. Um, I thought that the external auditor's annual report, we'd want to spend more time um, if we had questions and reading that. And um, so I wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time to do it, and that's why. So you're omitting 01, or we're actually going to be briefed on 01? Oh, no, we're going to, 601, we are so doing. We are doing, and, and, and 05, we're going to do 6.05, we're also going to do the budget survey. And these can be brought back at a later date. Okay. And that's <clears throat> because we're, we're deleting those because of why? Those other three? Time. 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 You give more time. More time the for the two. external audit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now call your vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Um, at this time, Dr. Kane will lead us through rec to approve the minutes. Where? Where? Okay. Whoops. Okay. Phew. Um, at this time, we're going to do the approval of the minutes for October 10th and October 12th. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? It's 17th. 10th and 17th. What did I say? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. The 10th and the 17th. So, so closed session and open session. Mm -hmm. just open they will both close open and close right October 10th would have been open 17th would have been closed I mean no they were all both open they were both open meetings but we also had, had a closed session had in closed so, session on the so we need too. to approve here let me redo the motion yeah go ahead I make a motion that we approve the minutes from October 10th and 17th for open and closed session second all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. all opposed say no the ayes have it now at this time, Dr. Kane will move us into recognitions. Pardon me. Did you do the? Did you ask? For the we 17? said ten and ten 17. and seventeen. Yes. Yep. I uh, will be happy Open to. Our first recognition is going to be um, <coughs> DES and the sheriff's office with a special recognition for their assistance in providing stop the bleed training for us. So we'll go forward, and Mr. Pender is going to bring that announcement. <coughs> Somebody else gave you 
Jackie. Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, we would like to recognize a few special guests um, that we have here um, from the Department of Emergency Services and also from the Queen Anne's County Sheriff's Office. And I would like for right now for Lieutenant Mark Meal to come forward, Chief Management Analyst Joe Sabori to come forward, and Lieutenant Greg Harrison come forward. If you gentlemen want to stand over there, please. I'm going to try to stay on script, but if you know me, I'm more apt to free lib and go on. Um, these three gentlemen you see up here, they do not like the limelight. They do not like the fame, the glory, those kinds of things. And to get them to come up here tonight for a small recognition um, means something really special to me. Um, school safety is something that we take very serious. Um, it's one of our top priorities. And what we realized last year, we did a lot of training with active assailant with the teachers um, during faculty meetings. But what we failed to realize, or I failed to realize, hey, we missed a large portion of our bus drivers. We miss our custodial staff. We miss the instructional assistants. We miss the um, front office staff, the substitutes. And so I went to Dr. Kane and I said, hey, the two weeks before school starts, we want to get everybody trained um, in awareness to a potential threat, how to respond to a potential threat, and then hemorrhaging control. And through her leadership, she gave me the opportunity to put a program together. And I knew exactly who to call and you three gentlemen. Um, Mr. Sabori and Lieutenant Meal, they handled the law enforcement piece of hear something, say something. Because if you're looking at the school bus drivers, and the examples I'm going to give you, we've had happen this year already. The school bus drivers, they did a presentation. Hey, when you're uh, checking your bus at the end of your route, what are you doing? Well, they're looking to see if anybody was left on the bus, first of all. But then they're cleaning the bus up, picking up a piece of paper. What does that piece of paper say? Are there any indicators on there that, uh, of a potential threat that might occur at a school? and what to do if that does become available. We had custodians come in for training and we train with them also. They're cleaning in the evening. They might find something that evening that could potentially have an impact on the school the next day. We've had that happen also this year. These gentlemen, when those tips come into us, react and go do a home visit to see if there is a potential threat. Um, this is something I didn't think I'd be talking about in my 23 years here when I first started in education. We were worried about when the fire alarm went off, how we're we gonna get out of the building and make sure our kids were accountable. It's a different time. There is no textbook um, that says you need to do A, B, and C, and D. But these gentlemen came and did presentations, like I said, for everyone. The front office staff, they're gonna be the ones in contact with 911. What kinds of questions do they need to be prepared to answer when that calls come in? Um, and I always say this part too, this was not a cookie cutter presentation. These individuals put together information that pertains specifically to each group that they were presented to. Um, the ANS staff, which is the supervisors, principals, um, teacher specialists, they actually got to do the hands-on portion to it, put everything they learned together that day in the afternoon to an active assailant. Um, and I see a few administrators in here. That was pretty eye-opening when you start hearing gunshots in the hallway. What does that sound like? What are you gonna do? How are you gonna react? Then the last portion, through the leadership of uh, Lieutenant Harrison, we now have a hemorrhage control uh, kit in each classroom that will be going out this week, um, Friday. So what we've learned from other um, incidents, that the people that are injured in the classroom, they're gonna be waiting for law enforcement to come clear those rooms. Those are where we're going to lose victims if something like this were to happen. Through Lieutenant Harrison's leadership, he uh, developed a um, hemorrhaging control kit. Like I said, it's going to be housed in every classroom. We already have standalone kits in the hallways and in the cafeterias, but we focused on that. And like I said, he brought in the real life mannequins where we got down and dirty into it and to show how easy that was. Um, some of the things that I took away from this was, hey, something like this could happen anytime, any place. I had so many teachers come up to me and staff and bus drivers and say, hey, what you gentlemen taught us today, we'll take with us for the rest of our life. I mean, how come we didn't have this years ago? Um, and again, I've gone way off script. But 
Um, I, truly, from the bottom of my heart, in the 23 years I've been here, that's probably the most meaningful um, training that I've ever been part of. And I just want to say thank you very much. And we have a um, certificate. We'll hand out to you. Thank you. Thanks. Sir. just want to reiterate not to repeat everything all over again but just thank you sincerely and we really did get a lot of messages emails from our teachers our administrators all of our staff telling us what meaningful professional development that was so thank you for that I mean cafeteria staff I mean staff everybody got the training and they absolutely were impressed and said how meaningful it was and how it really does make them think differently not only about what they do in school, but in the general public, wherever they are, they think differently about their surroundings and what they might do, so they feel more prepared. So we'll continue that. Thank you for your work. And so our next, was someone going to say that? Oh, okay. So our next award is our Spirit Award, and this award recognizes an employee who is enthusiastic about his or her job and the school system. We have some pretty savvy and enthusiastic employees here at the school board, and I'm happy to announce that one of our own is the new recipient of the Spirit Award. That person is Ms. Renee Wolf, Accountability Specialist. Ms. Renee Wolf, please come forward. Here's what one of her coworkers said. And this is from her partner in crime, I'm told, uh, Debbie Terry. This is what she had to say. Renee is a real go-getter, a mover and a shaker. She performs her job duties with so much energy and enthusiasm every day. She's consistently striving to make our central office the best that it can be, from organizing an event or program to setting up a central office display or rallying staff for an engaging activity. Renee is freely giving of her time, whether a coworker needs help or be it a school or teacher that needs her expertise. She never slows down and is always encouraging to all staff. She makes friends easily, she's reliable and hardworking. And Renee Wolf makes Queen Anne's County Public Schools a better place. So thank you, Ms. Wolf. <laughs> with you today, Ms. Wolf? My daughter, my mom, and my niece. So your mom and your niece come on oh, no. forward. We would like to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> come on, Ella. Come on, Ella. Come on, Ella. All right, so as much as Renee works diligently to make Queen Anne's County Public Schools one of the top school districts in the state, she's not alone in her pursuits. A little surprise here, but Renee is actually part of a dynamic duo. Uh, um, we'd like to also <laughs> give her a heartfelt um, spirit award to her partner in crime, Miss Debbie Terry, who is also an accountability <laughs> Ms. Terry works tirelessly for the betterment of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Debbie had no idea she was being recognized here tonight. She thought this was for her partner. But here's what Renee had to say about you. Debbie is what we like to call a Board of Education cheerleader. Her enthusiasm for her job and her coworkers is evident in all she does. Debbie looks for creative ways to boost morale and generate an atmosphere of camaraderie. Most recently, she, along with Renee Wolf, 
decorated a hall bulletin board here at the Board of Education to showcase central office employees' latest personal and professional achievements. And I want to say thank you for that. You got good pictures. Thank you. Um, I hate pictures of myself, but I'm up there and I'm okay with what she said. <laughs> Debbie is a staff motivator, and just like a cheerleader, she has spirit. We're lucky to have her at the board. She truly deserves the Spirit Award. Congratulations. We have another very special award tonight, and this is our Hero Award. And you know, uh, we give a Hero Award to a student who has exemplified the, the behaviors of a hero. So tonight is extra special. Uh, the Hero Award tonight recognizes a student who exhibited heroic actions. A Hero Award is given to a student who's done something for the good of others despite challenges. So tonight, we celebrate one young man who consistently embodied the very essence of our Hero Award. Queen Anne's County Public Schools would like to honor Jacob, and we all lovingly know him as Jake Sloan, a seventh grade student who attended Mattapeak Middle School. Sadly, Jake passed away in a tragic automobile accident on October 20th, but he left an indelible mark on so many, both in our community and within the halls of Mattapeak Middle School. Jake definitely made a difference during his matriculation through elementary school and middle school. Jake was a positive force and an exceptional student both academically and socially. At merely the age of 12, he exhibited character and caring for others that exceeded expectations of a young man his age. Through his acts of kindness for others, which were often witnessed by teachers and other staff at the school, it's come to our attention that Jake went out of his way to truly be a friend and good listener to those struggling to feel included and lack close friendships or self-confidence. Jake's parents, Mary and Pete Sloan, recently discovered that Jake had been sending positive affirmation emails to encourage these students. Almost daily, Jake lifted the spirits of these students, sending them inspiring messages to let them know he cared. We also learned as a result of an assignment in Jake's English language arts class that Jake's future career goals included becoming a professional baseball player for what Jake said would be about 10 years, <laughs> followed by attending seminary to become a pastor, most likely to continue to minister to those who need friendship and encouragement. Jake was an incredible young man who made a difference in the lives of school and his classmates. Jake's ability to look beyond himself and see others who were hurting will never be forgotten. Due to his remarkable impact on his school and community, we'd like to honor Jake Sloan posthumously with the much deserved Hero Award. His parents, Mary and Pete, are here to accept this award on Jake's behalf. Would you please come forward? like to recognize the many supporters that you've had with us tonight. So we have Mattapeak Middle School principal 
uh, assistant principal, come on forward. How many teachers? We've got lots of teachers, so wave at us, please. So please, uh, our administrators, I'm actually going to do something different. And I'm going to ask that all of the supporters come forward, okay. please, for we'll the one picture. Like this and then we'll do one like this, and then we'll do another with everybody. Right. That's okay. Come on down, both schools come forward. And we'll stand on the steps and do what we need to do to get everybody in here. Now I go to the back, go to the back, yeah. Way tall. Step on the next step. Okay. There you go. You got everybody in there? I'm way up here. this one okay I'm gonna step forward and take over for a few minutes because tonight we have two of our board members who are attending their last regular monthly Board of Education meeting we also have in attendance the sister of our lost board member Bishop Arlene Taylor so I'm gonna ask Debbie to come forward to and join us I'm going to thank these ladies for everything they've done I get emotional, so just bear with me. <laughs> I'll be all right. Um, in the four years, they've served their time for us and our community. Um, Jennifer, our vice president, and Annette, our president, please come forward. I want to thank you for your guidance, your insight, your leadership, and everything you've done for the system in the four years you've served. We do not want to forget that Arlene had a mission to serve her four years and she put forth a really good effort but unfortunately she's not here with us but we think of her all the time and I've asked Mr. Fister to get the bouquets of flowers that I have to present for them are they on the table in there Sorry. to your left maybe they've disappeared let me check oh wait a minute Jackie where were they yeah. no that's not them well then where are the lilies <laughs> no, that is not them. No. That's not them. No. No. Sorry. We didn't find the lost flowers. Now, someone in this audience presented these ladies with bouquets that are up at their seat. Who did this? This was special. Um, these are another bouquet that were delivered today. Here they come. They coming, dear? Okay. Oh, the other room. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Mark. <laughs> so I just want to bring your attention to the four years these ladies have served, and it's a really important thing to realize that not everybody is willing to step up to the table and, and serve in a capacity like this. It's very demanding, but we love it. It's what we do. It's our passion. We have great expectations for our students, and we want to be able to offer them everything to meet their expectations. These ladies go out after four years, and Arlene, unfortunately, didn't quite make it, but she achieved what she set herself out to go to do. The white lily in the middle of these sprays are in her honor, and I had asked they be set aside to give to Miss Taylor, but I think they misunderstood my direction. So that's, <laughs> they're in Arlene's um, <coughs> honor. And these ladies will finish out their term right before the December meeting when we induct our two 
new um, elected officials into this board and re-induct our current um, member who just went through the election process, Carrie, Tammy Harper, and Michelle Morissette will be joining us the first Wednesday in December. So thank you for being a part of this. And um, we, I look forward to serving two more years. The new members will be serving for four. And thank you for being with us, Debbie. I really appreciate it. And uh, we think of Arlene all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And before everyone leaves, these were giving given to us by uh, Jen's husband. Oh, Thank okay. you, Kurt. Yeah, <laughs> That's what I wondered when that where they came from. Okay, that was emotional. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my chair. I lost my chair. All right. Okay, so at this time. At this time, we will move on to community involvement. Um, and Dr. Kane, would you like to give your report? Absolutely. So it was a busy uh, time since our last board meeting. On October 12th was the Teacher of the Year Gala at uh, Martins West. Ms. Harlow and Ms. O'Connor were in attendance along with Ms. Moore, our Teacher of the Year at uh, Mattapeak Elementary School, along with Jen Schreckengoss, the principal, and several of the teachers were there. A teacher from Somerset County, Dr. Richard Warren, was named the Maryland Teacher of the Year. October 16th, we held the first meeting with the students, uh, the Superintendent Student Advisory Council. Always a great time. Two students from each middle school and each high school participate. This group is excited and ready to tackle challenges and offer solutions. They have many things to talk about. Uh, one of our first projects will be centered um, on using social media, i.e. Instagram, for this group uh, to publicize important but brief school district information. <laughs> youth, I tell you. On October 18th, I had the privilege of visiting schools on the district-wide professional development day. We uh, welcomed clerical employees to a professional learning opportunity centered on uh, SunGuard, our financial system, and uh, school funds online. And uh, of course, Mr. Fister and his team hosted that professional development, well attended, got lots of great reviews visited professional development at Bayside Elementary, uh, uh, Churchill Elementary, Queen Anne's County High School, all great things going on. Um, they did things like uh, professional development centered on equity, mathematics, language arts, writing, uh, student learning objectives, and the new observation platform. Uh, and also on October 18th, I'm happy to announce that I was inducted into my high school's Hall of Fame, uh, Baltimore City College High School. Alumni such as Kirk Smoke and, and Donald Schaefer are also in that Hall of Fame, so I feel really honored to accept that um, recognition. Congratulations, Dr. King. Thank you. On October 22nd, I hosted a meeting for the Superintendent's Environmental Education Collaborative, we call it SEEC, at the Chesapeake Bay Environmental Center. That collaborative was formed through a partnership uh, by superintendents and some environmental organizations with the goal of increasing high quality environmental education for students across the United States. Uh, I co-chair that collaborative alongside Dr. Sean McFetridge. Uh, he's a superintendent out in California, Alameda Unified School District. District. Uh, there are 20 states and Ontario that are involved in that collaborative. And I'd especially like to thank Judy Wink, the executive director, and Vicki Paulus, the assistant director for education programs at Chesapeake Bay Environmental Center. They were very, very welcoming and uh, shared a lot of information with our uh, CEC superintendents and that group. On October 26, um, <coughs> uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up. On the 18th, that was the Queen Anne's County High School uh, Hall of Fame. The 26th was my Hall of Fame. So thank you for, um, for that. At the, on the 30th, a very exciting day, I was able to visit the Maryland Fire and Rescue Institute. 
out off Ruthsburg Road, and we had several students there. There were about 13 students all together in that program, the majority coming from Queen Anne's County. We had a couple of students there from Kent County and uh, also from Talbot County, but we watched a uh, controlled burn. So for anybody who has not yet seen a controlled burn, we probably have photos up on our website um, and possibly a video. It is just a very interesting, you talk about hands-on learning, so our students gear up with their firefighter uh, gear and they go and fight fires hands-on so they get all the training they do um, you know lots of learning in the classroom but a great deal of learning as you might imagine um, hands-on so hats off to them and we're looking to recruit more students who might be interested for next year on the 31st um, I was able to have a conversation with the folks over at Howard University uh, their School of Education Dr. January Vance and Dr. Wuta who are going to be working with us as we work to diversify our workforce so they're already working with us to provide information for students who are interested in attending a uh, HBCU but they are also going to work with us as we recruit uh, or work to recruit uh, teachers of color, uh, male teachers going into teaching, and um, all those that might not be traditionally uh, the teachers that we hire. So they're going to do some work with us, and we're really excited about that. We started our superintendent monitoring visits this October, and we're going to continue through the month of November. I'll be attending the National Alliance of Black School Educators Conference on Thursday and Friday of this week, followed by an opportunity to uh, welcome our students what's our girls group called um, on Saturday destined to, destined to rise so looking forward to welcoming those young ladies on Saturday thank you <coughs> at this time mr. Paluski thank you madam president uh, I echo uh, many things that dr. Kane had the two that I would like to add uh, maybe that I hope she did mention if I did I'm repeating myself and that is uh, October 12th was the Graysonville Elementary School the dedication uh, that many of us attended uh, and Mr. DiMaggio did as well that was a an outstanding ceremony I thank Mr. Pinder for leading that effort with the school and, and such a tremendous job that him and his staff have done uh, the second thing October 22nd uh, Dr. Kane, as well as Mr. Tully, uh, Ms. O'Connor was there as well, uh, led a great community effort with, uh, at uh, Queen Anne's County High School with our business community around career and technology education. Uh, this was a great way for us to showcase the programs that we have, but also maybe programs that we don't offer that we need to offer. And it was a great way for them to ask questions and, um, as we continue this work around career and technology education. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we're going to um, go to our student board members, and we will start with Marissa this time. Hi, everyone. My name is Marissa Teddy. I represent Kent Island High School. Um, November is a busy month. The Environmental Club put a lot of hard work into Kent Island High School's landscaping. I want to give a shout out to Ms. Charlene Wright, the advisor, and Ronnie Meyer, the president, for making that happen. My <coughs> subcommittee for NHS is hosting a coat drive in the month of November. Donations go to the local, local Haven Ministries shelter, and you can drop off your coats in the main office. Um, auditions for Ken Island High School's Spring Musical is during the week of November 12th, so next week. Ken Island High School field hockey team and cross country team won Bayside Championships and field hockey is playing state semifinals tonight. The sports awards ceremony will be held tomorrow <coughs> evening, November 8th at 7 p.m. at Ken Island High School. We will have a senior meeting tomorrow, November 8th, to discuss cap and gown orders. On Monday, November, t November 12th, student government will host a blood drive in the auxiliary gym. We will have a full school assembly on November 13th. Chris Heron will be presenting his Purple Project presentation. And Windsor Sports begin practice on November 15th. Thank you. Thank you. Ariel? <coughs> Hello, I'm Ariel Miles. I represent Queen Anne's County High School. Um, the QACHS SGA and I will attend the first ever leadership summit at Washington College on Friday. Um, Salisbury University will be on campus on the 13th to admit students on site, so that's exciting. Um, winter sports tryouts start on November 15th. Our girls soccer team is playing right now in regionals at Washington College. They're playing Falston. As of right now, it's tied 2-2. Two to two. They just went in overtime. <laughs> I couldn't be there, so I'm getting updates. <laughs> um, Sadly, our football team on Friday lost to Ken Island, 28 to 23. 
Um, volleyball, my team lost on Monday, um, three to zero, which is sad. So my senior volleyball season is over. Um, so we're really hoping that soccer pulls it out so we can get something positive going. <laughs> that's all I have today. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can now we'll move on to community participation. Ms. Harlow. Yes, we ask that all speakers keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Organizations, municipalities, and elected officials may receive five minutes to speak, and individuals may receive three minutes. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item an agenda item that is expected to appear in the future or a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those are intended to be discussed at the bargaining table. This is not a proper venue to address specific student or employee personnel matters, especially those matters on legal appeal to the board. Comments about the actions or statements of an individual staff member are not appropriate for public comments and should be referred to the superintendent of schools to be processed through the available channels. Citizens participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have a specific question, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question in a timely manner at a later date. The board respects your desire and your right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens na and name calling when you offer your critique. And the first person we have signed up to speak is Richard McNeil. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Richard McNeil and the president of the retired group. Um, I got to remember the name because it just changed this year, so I'll practice that. Uh, I want to start off with uh, thanks to Teresa Steinheim and HR um, for her efforts to educate those retirees who are over 65 uh, who are having their prescription and health insurance changed from Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Um, there were over 100 in this room last Friday to listen to representatives from these different groups to help alleviate some of the nervousness over this change. And uh, Teresa did a great job of, of communicating all of this to us, so we appreciate that. Um, there's still many out there uh, who have communicated with me that they're nervous about this switch, and as we know, change of any form uh, is difficult and, and challenging. Uh, we've been assured that there's a transition team to help answer questions and to guide all of this as it goes forward. Um, so that takes place January 1st, and uh, so we're looking forward to that. But my thanks to Teresa uh, for her effort on that part. Um, I, for one, am, am very happy that the lockbox uh, initiative was passed by the voters yesterday. Uh, I think it's uh, a, a great move uh, when the uh, casinos were approved that a big chunk of that money was to be set aside for the improvement of uh, schools and technology and so forth around the state um, and it hasn't happened uh, in that matter and I, I really look forward to the way this is going to play out if it plays out the way it's supposed to over the next three years and then from then on out. Uh, I encourage the board to stay on top of the formula change that I think is going to come uh, with that um, and like I said I look forward to seeing how this goes over the next three or four years because it's going to be incremental as I understand it and superintendent I'm sure that you are up to date on that so uh, thank you for that um, I want to congratulate Miss O'Connell for her election and for her lack of television ads so it didn't interfere with anything I was watching so thank you for that and thanks to Jennifer George for your service and uh, Annette for all of your work over the time and, and so forth. Uh, it's a tough to be at that point making decisions and so forth. Um, November 14th, I will be representing our retired group at the Annapolis. Uh, they're having a pre-legislative preview on issues that perhaps will involve pension and uh, anything uh, involving school reform, but especially those who are involving those who are in the retirement group. So that'll be on the 14th. And uh, just attended um, my 50th college reunion, and I don't know where the time went. And uh, we were, our, our year was uh, honored this year as a part of the uh, celebration. 
And it was great to see people that I haven't seen in some cases for over 49 years. Uh, but that 50 years went real quick. And uh, I appreciate my time and education. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next person we have signed up is Mr. Bob Simmons. Thank you. Uh, good to be with you again tonight. And I am continuing to talk ab about the Kerwin in, uh, Commission and the, ben the benefit that it's going to have for the state if we follow its rules and do what it says well. Uh, I am, frankly, I'm going to cut this short because I don't have that much to say tonight. I ha was going to uh, give some information uh, about uh, a Facebook page that is being uh, formed, uh, but unfortunately I didn't meet deadlines of supplying data that I was supposed to, and I can't tell you about it yet, but certainly I'll tell you about it at the next meeting. Uh, th but this Facebook is, uh, page is designed for people who are interested to get uh, all the data that they need or all the data that they uh, should have about the Kerwin Institute and to encourage them to talk to one another and to encourage them to volunteer uh, to go uh, work with the legislators in our state commission in our state uh, government to have a broader input about this than is being done now uh, as Frankly, I'm afraid, just, just as we heard Richard say, uh, that uh, people don't like to ch change, and particularly large bureaucracies like the school system of the state of Maryland do not like change. And that's mainly who's talking right now. A few legislators and the people who were on the committee and very effective full-time lobbyists from the, from the unions and other groups in here, uh, and the citizen is not fully looked after in here, I think, and that we in Queens County are so close to the legislative process that we can uh, influence that better than anybody else other than the people in Anne Arundel County. Uh, I'll be back next week. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person signed up is Mr. Jay Falstead. Good afternoon, board. My name is Jay Falstad. I live in Millington. And uh, Carrie, congratulations. Jennifer and Annette, uh, thanks for all of your service. I know you don't do it for the big paychecks, so uh, <laughs> thank you to, for your service to the county. You may have heard over the past couple weeks that um, there have been some kids across the country that were killed at bus stops. Uh, flashing red lights, cars go through bus stop and end up killing some kids. Tragically, there was a young girl and her two twin brothers that were killed just last week. After hearing that, you know, we're all parents, so care about kids. Uh, I asked my own daughter who rides the bus if she's ever seen a car go through a bus, a bus stop. She said it happens all the time. Um, I was shocked to hear that, so I contacted two bus drivers that I know, one in Kent County, one in Queen Anne's and just ask the question, do they have uh, any incidences of cars driving through bus stops? And the answer was it happens almost every day. Um, one bus driver in particular said he's had a couple of instances where he, he's had to grab a kid on the right-hand side of the school bus to keep them from going out because somebody was going on the right-hand side of a bus trying to get around. And his response to me is it's not a question of when but or if but when it's going to happen and so um, earlier today I talked to uh, Mr. Pender and asked him some of these questions and it turns out that this is a problem it sounds like some work has been done but not enough and so I just want to encourage this board to try and work with the sheriff's office with the state's attorney's office 
um, more has to be done because the last thing that we would want in this community is to lose a child uh, to something that is preventable, uh, preventable. And this is totally preventable. Um, but clearly the penalties have to be uh, increased dramatically as a preventative measure to keep people from doing this. And I hope that you all will consider taking some sort of action um, before it's too late. Uh, because I, I fear that an accident could happen soon. So anyway, I just wanted to advance that. So thanks for your time. Thanks for your service. And Jay, uh, yes. <clears throat> could I tell you that last year we started working on this um, because of Mr. Pinder bringing this to our attention. <laughs> yeah. And um, we, um, we are by far not done working on this because we agree one child is too many children for anybody. And, and maybe not even a depth injury, whatever it may be, is too much. Um, we ask that you keep this on your radar and that you keep uh, going back to the county commissioners, um, speaking to Mr. Hoffman or Sheriff Hoffman, um, so that we can make sure that this is taken care of. I'm glad to hear that. If, uh, if more parental involvement is needed, I'm happy to volunteer. Thank you. Um, so anyway, thanks for your time. Thank you. And I appreciate your service. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Is there anyone else who would like to say anything? Okay, that will. <laughs> <laughs> Shame on you. That will close our present public comment time and we move forward in the agenda. At this time, we, uh, Dr. Kane, will you introduce the presentations? Absolutely. So we have one presentation, or uh, we'll start with the first one, and that is for our external audits. Um, we have an annual audit, and uh, we have the auditors here with us this evening, and Mr. Fister will lead, and they will join in. We ready? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gain. Um, President DiMaggio, members of the board, I just want to give a brief little overview before I introduce our two external auditors that are here with us this evening about the process that we go through every year. Uh, this is our annual uh, external audit um, required by law, as we'll see here shortly. Uh, it's something that um, you know, gives confidence and transparency to the financial transactions we do as a school district. So the purpose tonight is for you and for the administration to gain a deeper understanding of the external um, audit, its process, uh, pr purpose, and then its process. It is required by state law, section 5109, that each county board shall provide for an annual audit of its financial transactions. The audit shall be made by a certified public accountant who are licensed and approved by the state superintendent. So every spring we send off the letter who our uh, external auditors will be, the MSDE signs off that they agree, and we move forward with that. Again, according to 5109, the results are court of public record, and the audit must be submitted to MSD by September 30th, which is, the law says three months at the end of the fiscal year, but for us that's September 30th, as with every other school system in Maryland. The caveat here, failure to do so, though, the state board could petition to the comptroller of the treasury to withhold funding of state aid for us if we do not comply, and that is something that will not happen uh, while I'm here, we will not have funding withdrawn from us, um, as happened to other counties in the past. Uh, the timeline, we engage with, it's, it's called an engagement letter. We, we engage with the auditors that's selected for that fiscal year, uh, as in February. Uh, we will do some preliminary field work, such as testing of transactions and things like that in May. But the intensive field work begins after our bo books are closed on June 30th. We're already into the next year. That's why sometimes you'll hear me, I'm um, between three fiscal years at any one time, and, and this audit is part of the reason for that. So they'll start in late July, early August, do all their intensive work. Two external auditors are here on site for two weeks. They complete their financial analysis throughout that time, all the way up to probably September 15th, gives two, three weeks of the report preparation that's before you. I believe I left a copy uh, on your board in case you didn't bring a copy with you. <coughs> and that report is due to MSD by September 30th. Again, like I mentioned, no ifs, ands, or buts. 
Um, from what we look at and what the board is probably most interested in is on a budgetary basis. You know, from year to year, we budget as we go through deliberations and work with the county and the state as to what our budget is going to be this year. And then you want to know, okay, how did we do? So in this past year, that the audit that this is focused on, fiscal year 2018, we ended with a positive fund balance of $507,000 left over, which is one half of 1% of budgeted expenditures. We couldn't probably ask for anything better. Uh, you certainly don't want to spend down to every dime. Um, you certainly don't want to have a lot of money left over. Uh, so this is certainly more than acceptable. That gives us a total unassigned fund balance available to us of $1.1 million. And one of the things that we've talked about, I think, as a board um, is what's an adequate amount of fund balance? And we've talked about it. And according to GFOA, um, they're saying two months of operating expenses is what should be an adequate fund balance. For us, that's $8 million, and right now we're at $1.1 million. We'll never get to $8 million, nor would I even propose that we get to $8 million, but certainly $1.1 is a, is a step there so that if we do have some anomalies, such as a bad winter or some machinery or some um, you know, HVAC equipment that goes down and we need to, we have the funds here that we would be able to then petition the commissioners to do a transfer, so therefore we sort of can take care of our own house and our own needs rather than having to go over and ask for an additional appropriation. So that's basically the purpose of having a healthy fund balance. Yes, Captain Kelly. To explain um, where the 1.1 comes from? If Left, it's an accumulation of leftover funds from year to year to year to year. Okay. So we added to that. To get to the 1.1, we added that because we ended with another 507 this year. I thought that we had uh, taken money out of our budget or out of the this fund for um, your negotiations. We did. This is unassigned fund balance. So in, and if you look, when we get into the okay, discussion, okay. and you'll see our fund balance, you will see a line that's, okay. that shows the amount that we used for 19 out of their fund balance. This is just what's unassigned. Because we have to, by law, we have to restrict some things. We want to do some things with our, uh, our fund balance, such as funding our OPEB liability. So this is what's left over, okay. that we have some discretion to do with what we want to do. Thank you for that question. Um, so on a budgetary basis, exactly where did we end up the year? So the goal is, of course, to have every category um, in a positive balance. The absolute goal is that in total we end with a positive balance. So that goal was met. However, we did not meet the goal of the administration category. It was over uh, spent in this particular year by $11,650. Where that $11,650 came from was an overexpenditure in legal expenses by about $38,000. When we did our projections for where we would be at the end of June, um, on May 23rd, we had anticipated that we would need about an additional $20,000 in funds to get us through that fiscal, through the end of that fiscal year. It turned out that we needed almost $34,000. So that difference that we did, we were able to unaccount for because of the large volume of legal expenses that came in at the end of the year, it threw our administration category over by $11,000. Had we been closer with that estimation that we made in, on May 23rd of needing about an additional $20,000, um, we would have been right on par with exactly where it was. It was just something that was unexpected. Um, and therefore, that's why the deficit is there. And this is exactly from the scheduled revenues, expenditures, and conferences on page 48. Why were we so far over on our legal expenses? I don't remember that. Last year, 2017? 2018, so this past June. Okay, so why were I can we certainly get you some detail. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to see that. Please. Yeah, it was a 60, if I recall, I have it right here. Um, And while you look for that, we Mr. had a, I'm, I'm sorry, we had a $60,000 budget and total expenditures for the year were 98691 And I believe the board has received a copy of all of the uh, um, expenditures for legal fees for the last several years? Yes. Okay. Yes. I haven't. Yeah, we got it a while ago. We did? We did? When? Um, last month? When I was asking what money was, was being spent on my well. censure, board that came out. They gave oh, us uh, all three years. I swear I never. I gotta look back. I don't ever remember seeing yeah, that email. I don't remember seeing that myself. 
That's okay. why I asked. If, if not, we, I can certainly we that's can certainly fine. That's fine. That's fine. You can move on. Okay. We'll, we'll find it. Right. So with, with that, in my short little presentation, I'd allow, again, like to introduce uh, Ms. Beth Horner and Ms. Brenda Leaf. I'd like to bring them up to the, to the um, podium here to go through um, their brief analysis um, of what they saw through the audit and their recommendations going forward. They're from um, Beatty Satchel uh, LLC, um, actually formerly, no, formerly addressed it as BSC Group LLC. So with, with that, I would like to turn it over to Beth Horner. Very good. Good evening. Thank you so much for inviting us uh, to speak and address uh, these topics with you this evening. We also want to take this opportunity to thank you for engaging BSC Group as your internal and in independent, rather, um, financial auditors for the fiscal year FY18. Uh, we conducted substantive testing spanning all of the funds of Queen Anne County's Board of Education including the general fund, which included both your restricted and your unrestricted funds, the food service fund, your school construction fund, which of course is your capital projects fund, as well as your trust and agency funds. We are um, pleased to report and congratulate you on a clean opinion on those financial statements for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2018. As Mr. Fister mentioned, the financial audit was filed on time with MSDE in advance of the September 30th deadline. The compliance audit, the compliance <coughs> phase of our audit of Queen Anne County Sorry. Board of Education, uh, the federal grant programs will begin within the next several weeks. And there is another report that will be due to MSDE, actually to the federal data clearinghouse by the end of the year, 12-31-18. So we will be, um, right on track to complete that in advance of that deadline. A second report that's part of your financial statement package in front of you um, entails internal control. The re report that you have in your packet says that there were no findings included um, in the internal control report of the financial audit for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 18. So if we can take just a moment to um, gauge a lay of the land of your financial statement package. As you may recall in prior years, which is also the case this year, there are three sets of books represented in your financial packet. First of all, if you would take a look at page 48, you will see the first type of books that are reported in your package are a budgetary basis. And that's what Mr. Fister just spoke on briefly. Page 48 includes your financial activity, a one-year snapshot of the results of your operations that also include activity related to open purchase orders, your encumbrances as current year expenditures. A second set of books that's part of your financial package are the fund basis financial statements. Those statements are found on pages 16 through 20. Your fund basis financial statements basically start with your budgetary basis financial statement and then also make adjustment for uh, open purchase orders related to the current year as well as prior year open purchase orders or encumbrances. Again, the fund basis financial statements, which are your pages 16 to 20, are a one year current year snapshot of the activities of the school system. The third set of books present in your financial statement package are the government-wide financial statements, and you'll see that on pages 14 and 15 of your package. The government-wide financial statements, basically that presentation is analogous to what a commercial entity would um, be required to present in their financial statements. Those government-wide financial statements on page 14 and 15 include things, um, include capital assets, net of depreciation. They also include capital lease activity, pension liabilities, and OPEB liabilities. Those government-wide financial statements are more than a one-year view of operations because they also reflect those capital assets, which are like your buildings, your furniture, your fixtures, your equipment that last more than one year. Um, 
Another section of your financial statement are your notes. Page 21 is where they begin. And your financial statement notes are required disclosures that provide additional details for, for the benefit of the users of your financial statement. So you can see there are a, a number of pages and required disclosures and, and quite a bit of depth of detail there. The next section of your financial statements are, is entitled Required Supplementary Information. And that begins on page 48. And we actually were just there because that's the budgetary basis financial statement we spoke of. And it goes through page 53. That required supplementary information section is required by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. And it requires expanded information in connection with your pension, your pension funding, your OPEB, and your OPEB funding. The final section of your financial statement is entitled Other Supplementary Information, and it begins on page 54, and it ends with the end of your package at page 58. The Other Supplementary Information section is basically at the direction and the discretion of the board as to what's included in that. In this year's current financial package, we've got combining financial statements of the non-major funds of Queen Anne's County, as well as a schedule related to your school construction activity, related to your um, food service activity, as well as a schedule of your school activities funds at the various schools. So now that we've got a lay of the land as far as how your financial statements are organized into the sections and the different bases that we're reporting on, let's take a little bit of a deeper dive on page 14. Page 14, again, is one of the two pages that's the government-wide focus. If you recall, the government-wide, again, is including um, more than a one-year snapshot of the Board of Education. Let's take a look at, let's start at the bottom. Close to the bottom of the page, you'll see unrestricted deficit of 196 million. Very large number. And we're gonna get to the bottom of why that number is as large as it is, as well as why you're in a deficit position. Um, Moving towards the top of the page, looking in the asset section, you'll see a little bit of detail related to capital assets. Queen Anne County Board of Education has undepreciated total capital assets of approximately 164 million. You'll see 10 million of that is in land and construction in progress currently. And when I say currently, I mean June 30th, 2018. And the remainder, 154 million, is in other depreciable assets. Again, your financial statements reflect that this is at cost, less depreciation. Let's go to the middle of the financial statement into the liabilities, because here are where some of the even larger numbers are displayed. In the liability section, you'll see non-current liabilities. <coughs> You'll see a line item of due with one year, due within one year rather, and due in more than one year. There's non-current liabilities on the government-wide financial statements, total approximately 179 million, 360,000 of which are due payments that are due within the next year, fiscal year 2019. 171 million of the 179 million figure that you have there is related to the OPEB liability. And we're going to talk a little bit more about OPEB in a minute. What is unearned revenue? Unearned under liability. Unearned revenue is its receipts that you've received for which um, the requirements of the receipts of that revenue have not been met. In other words, there are some grants that fund in advance of the expenditures and until all of the, the um, conditions and stipulations of the grant are satisfied, it's deemed unearned. Thank you. Thank you. 179 non-current liabilities that we're talking about, the aggregate of that line item, 
171 million, as I mentioned, relates to the OPEB liability. <coughs> 4.8 million of that number relates to Queen Anne County's allocation of their share of the Maryland State Retirement Pension li unfunded liability. Two million dollars of that 179 million is related to Johnson Controls equipment and laptops that were purchased in prior years. It's your capital lease obligations. And the remaining component of that 179 million non-current liability is accrued unpaid leave for your employees and staff. And that totals approximately 819,000. Let's talk a little bit more about fund balance. If you would flip to footnote 11 with me, it's on page 45. We're looking in the far left-hand column right now. The, the column heading is major fund, general fund. As you can see at the very bottom, your total fund balances for the general fund, $3.3 million. Going up one line, the next to the bottom line, you can see unassigned current, prior years in current, that totals the $1.1 million of unassigned that you uh, saw previously in Mr. Fister's PowerPoint. Then moving forward um, or upward on the form, you can see there's also assignments of the fund balance. And I believe there was a question earlier related to this for Mr. Uh, Fister. Um, the assigned fund balance totals 1.62 million, and that includes assignments of fund balance related to future insurance costs, the long-term portion of the accrued annual leave, retirement and remaining retirement incentives, and the open POs, open purchase orders, which are your encumbrances of 199,000. Moving up to the center of the page, a portion of your fund balance is also committed, and that is the 537, I'm sorry, $534,000 amount of that, 200,000 has been committed to fund the OPEB liability. 100,000 has been committed related to the safety and security initiatives. And 234,000 has been um, committed related to the current expense budget, which is your FY19 budget. I have a question. Yes. On the um, long, term, long term accrued annual leave. Yes. 615,000 that's assigned out of the 171 million how is that relating to the uh, OPEP I think oh uh, well uh, the um, the 200 I'm sorry the 200,000 that's committed related to the OPEP um, I want to be sure that I understand your question well you said out of the 171 million yes the OPEP liability Yes. Like about $7 million is to the retirement and the laptops, which leaves us about, what, 164. Right. Of the do, why does that differ from, I don't understand. Okay. From the non-current liabilities page, on page 14, the government-wide, the total non-current liabilities full boat were $179 million. Of the 179, 171 is the OPEB liability, and we'll speak a little bit further about the OPEB in a moment. 4.8 million related to the, the state retirement system. The 2 million was for Johnson's control and the laptops, and the remainder was accrued unpaid leave, long term and long term. Current. So, how does that differ from the long term accrued annual leave on page? 45. Um, there are a few different components in that, and then we can be able to provide the detail for you on that. I don't have the detail right in front of me okay. on that question, but we will get that answer to you. All right. Let me and, I, and I think, Captain Kelly, your other comment, I mean, it could be uh, just a semantics. When we have OPEB liability, $200,000, that's that's our part of a down payment on the $171 million yes. that Beth's going to explain. All right. Both a liability, just one is how we're going to get there, and one is what the true liability is. Okay. I think that might have been part of your original question as well. Exactly. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate that. So we, um, 
we just went over not only the unassigned, the assigned, but also the committed on their fund balance. Um, and we did round out um, discussing the open purchase orders of 198,000 at June, at June 30th, 2018. And we mentioned the term OPEB a number of times this evening. And OPEB basically stands for other post-employment benefits. It refers to the benefits other than the pension that a state and local government employee receives as part of his or her package of retirement benefits. Primary examples of that, of course, are medical and dental uh, health insurance benefits. But this is the largest, the OPEB area is the largest change to all state and local government financial statements for fiscal year 18. Um, GASB, which is the Government Accounting Standards Board, issued a statement number 75 that had to do with the mandated presentation of OPEB liabilities on all state and local government financial statements. This was a change from the former GASB Statement 45, which also governed for FY17 the presentation of these other post-employment benefits. In 17, FY17, under the GASB 45, state and local governments, which include every school board across the state of Maryland and across the nation, were able to incorporate their OPEB liability, uh, their ongoing OPEB liability, a little bit at a time into their government-wide financial statements, which are your page 14 and 15. With the onset of GASB 75, which again was mandatory for FY18, all state and local governments, including school boards, were required to incorporate their full OPEB liability onto their government-wide financial statements. If you flip for one moment back to page 14, you will see that the full liability is included in your financial statements. The line item, non-current liabilities due in more than one year that we spoke about a few moments ago, you'll see the 178,772,458 figure. Of that figure, 171,829,758 is your ongoing OPEB liability. Your OPEB liability is annually actuarially determined and valued. It's based on the actual census data of Queen Anne County's public schools. It also factors in mortality tables, stipulated plan discount rates, and also other actuarial assumptions. In your financial statement notes number one and note number six, um, there is a description and further details with regard to the plan as well as how the plan was valued. A final item of note related to the implementation of GASB 75, the Government Accounting Standards Board mandated with that mandatory implementation that we also needed to, everyone needed to restate their beginning balance, their beginning OPEB liability. So this resulted in a prior period restatement. You'll see that on page 15 of your financial statement. <coughs> if you look it's close to the next to the last line on your financial statement, you will see prior period adjustment totaling 128,614,617. Again, the prior period adjustment is not a correction of an error. It is a reflection of the GASB's mandated presentation change as a result of Statement 75. Additional information, again, related to your OPEB liabilities are within Note 1 and Note 6. Note 1 begins on page 21, and Note 6 it begins on page number 38. Um, and you can see, beginning on page 38, 39, on into 40, um, exactly the detail related to how it was valued and how it needs to be presented on your financial statements. 
Um, one thing that's very important to note, um, we have received many questions related to the OPEB um, from various parties. How do we fund? How do you fund? How does a board fund the OPEB liability? Uh, it is a very, very large number, and the, the way that it's presented on your financial statements in the government-wide, again, is required to be the full boat liability related to the benefits, the actuarial valuation of the benefits for your current employees and retirees, and the way that you actually fund it is on a pay-as-you-go basis year to year. And as you can see, you have made the motion with regard to your budget to provide a provision for $200,000 towards that liability. As Mr. Fister stated, um, there is uh, no way in any one year or even in any short multiple of years that any state or local government is able to fully fund their OPEB liability. So when you're looking at page 14 and it comes down to a very large deficit, um, I pretty much assure you most all of the school boards currently are in the same position. Very large numbers and very large prior period restatements hit their financial statements as a result of this mandatory um, governmental accounting standards board statement. Um, I do want to congratulate you again on behalf of all of BSC group on your clean opinion. And we do thank you again for the opportunity uh, to serve as your independent financial statement auditors for 18. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, uh, we've, we've set aside 200000 for <coughs> payment toward this. But and my question is, if you, you're, you're planning to have enough money to do the benefits when people retire. So what is the recommendation when you, when you gradually get to where you should be, you would have a big pot of money sitting there for when they retire? Is that the concept? And we have a lot of, get a lot of grief for having a fund balance sitting there. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, the, the county governments themselves are in, in the similar position. They will have a, a large OPEB liability as well without that um, pot of reserves uh, for that. Um, really, the one thing in your budget that you have, we have to be sure you can accommodate is the premium, are the premiums related to the, the medical health, the dental insurance for those retirees. Um, there is no requirement to have it funded more quickly or on any specific timeline beyond the pay-as-you-go budgetary basis. The, the GASB 75 is requiring all state and local governments to present the actuarial evaluation of if it had to be all paid today, the present value today of what will be owed, it's there. It's a matter of disclosure. Um, at this point, did you have something you wanted to no, add? No, perfect. Oh, okay. Perfect. Is that the 128 million? That was the prior period restatement. Okay. Um, thank you for that question. Because the prior period restatement, as you may recall, we had to restate the beginning balance. Right. So that was as of July 1, 2017. Okay. So that was the prior period restatement that basically reflected as if statement 45 never existed and statement 75 always had been in place. And every state and local government would have an actuar actuarially determined value for that. And that is something that you engage, I believe, Bolton Partners, you engage as a board in advance of the financial statement audit. Uh, they uh, request census data from your human resources uh, and finance department when in that regard. So from this point forward, unless they come up and supersede GASB 75 with yet a new one, you will always have the full unfunded liability on the face of your government-wide, page 14. Um, and page 15 will no longer include a prior period restatement that only needed to be done one time. And there is, the, in the footnote 6, it crosswalks. Um, and provides that disclosure how we got from one to the other for yourselves and the users of your financial statements. So we only put in a very small portion every year, but we have to show the whole liability. Yes. 
and there is no risk of ever one day coming up to the fruition where we have to put it all out at once? Or is there that possibility? At this point, what's required to be disclosed is the unfunded liability. And I would say, as a general principle, the school boards and many, if not most, of the local and state governments will always have potentially a large number there. And, and Ms. Harlow, Ms. Harlow, to your point, yeah. we'll, we'll be working closely with the county government to kind of get an idea of what their expectations are. Because when this first came out, it was, oh, it's going to affect bond ratings and it was going to do this. And, and there's a lot of county, it, and it's not at, at the current moment. But it is something that's there on the books. It is something that should be funded, you know, as required. Um, but as Beth mentioned, there's no, you know, got to have this done by tomorrow kind of thing and there's nothing that's going to come down and say you need to fully fund this so the attempt of the two hundred thousand dollars is a down payment somehow whatever we could afford going forward to put towards this huge liability which has developed over time where has this large liability come from the large liability there was always an ongoing cost to be associated with these future benefits and that was always more than what we were putting into it yes ma'am um, absolutely that's absolutely that's absolutely my answer. in in Thank former you. under former standards it was something that was maintained on the books but not required to be recorded in the financial statement right formerly there was some financial statement disclosure but not on the face of the government-wide right. financial statements for fy18 full boat on page 14. Um, and the county, it's interesting what you said because the county, I don't know what their number is, but they still get a triple A bond, you know, rating. Mm -hmm. And they really, you know, they're very proud of that. Right. So. And, 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 and as Ms. Warner um, mentioned, that's because every state and local government is in the exact same thing. So if you're going to raise the bar or lower the bar, they're all being raised and lowered at the same, same point. If one was, use Montgomery County example, if they were fully funded, you know, 100%, that could affect something, but everybody's in the same boat. Everybody's in the same boat. Absolutely. Alrighty then. And okay. earlier, um, earlier there was a question, Captain Kelly, just to respond back with regard to the compensated absences. The, on page eight, um, page 16, um, the, which is the, on the fund basis statement, in the first column, general fund down to the accrued compensated absences, there's where the 203,000 are uh, in terms of a liability that matches to the 615 we saw previously to build up uh, upwards towards the 819,000 that um, was reserved in the fund balance. I'm sorry, I didn't know that. The 203 is our what we've budgeted. Current. 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 Picture. That's not what we budgeted to handle the, this year's bills, right? This is going toward the payment. Off. This, this is a. <coughs> if you, want to, you want to speak to it? Go ahead. It, it? It's nothing that is budgeted for this uncompensated absence. What this is is this is what the value is of the employees, the twelve-month employees who own annual leave at June thirtieth. What's the value of that leave? So it isn't something that's necessarily budgeted. I mean, we do budget a small amount for people that, you know, through attrition and things like that. But if everybody that was a 12-month employee decided to leave June 30th and we had to pay out their vacation, that's yes. the liability you're yes. seeing. Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very Appreciate much. Appreciate it very much. Thank, Thank you. you. And I guess I'll just stay right here. <laughs> So at this time, Mr. Fister will speak with us about the budget survey. Once again, um, thank you, Dr. Kane, uh, President DiMaggio, members of the board. Um, we wanted to kind of get an idea of some input from the community, our stakeholders and things like that with a budget survey. And I believe this county has been doing it for quite a few years. What I wanted to do is change it from a little bit from last year, you know, where as opposed to seeing the actual survey, let's have some discussion about what it is that we're looking for and move forward so that when we do publish the survey, which will be coming out, and you'll see it in the, in, the, in the presentation, that we've garnered all the information that we're looking for through this survey. So with that, um, again, I'd like to start with a, to gain a deeper understanding of the budget priorities of parents, staff, and external stakeholders. 
So our 2020 budget, our target, our target audience for this particular survey is going to be parents, our staff, and our external stakeholders, and we'll get to the, who those are in a few minutes. What we'd like to do is put this survey online Monday, November 19th, and it will remain open through Friday, January 4th to give people plenty of time for input. Uh, we'd like to make some announcements on our webpage leading up to November 19th, make some announcements on social media, an email to staff, so we cover that group. And then reminders as we get near the end of it that, hey, we've got a budget survey out there, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's hear your voices. Um, and the results we will share at the January 16th budget work session with what we've determined those results to be. So with parents, we're going to be asking things such as how many children in your household attend Queen Anne's County Public Schools and what level, elementary, middle, high? Are you satisfied with the quality of instruction? Do you feel that we're doing this in a safe and secure environment? Are there accesses to career uh, technology education pathways? Do you want to see more additional advanced coursework, things along those lines? Um, and then getting into the actual budget priorities, have them rank. Or are you looking for an increase in academic achievement? You want to see more competitive salaries and benefits. I'm not going to read all of these. Uh, textbooks and technologies, or we feel that you know, we need to put a priority there. Um, so, and then, of course, student safety and our aging facilities you know, or other comments that have been in other budget surveys, and we'll continue that going forward. The second group is the staff. Obviously, they have a, a vested interest in what we do here. So we're going to, are you full-time or part-time? Um, I believe the part-time employee um, capturing that data was not in prior years. So we're going to capture that because obviously they have a voice as well. And again, do employees have children? It gives us some, some basic data that we can you know, start to see exactly uh, you know, what it is that we need to do to satisfy um, employees, staff, and so forth. What, what employee class are you in? A teacher, support administration, uh, or school-based administration? You're in a support role. And then, as you had, as I've mentioned before, I'm going to be very big on customer service, at least from my department. And we've done some training across some other departments on customer service. So do you feel that when you call in to the finance office for exams, that you're treated you know, professionally and move forward with those kind of recommendations? Um, again, Staff, what would be their budget priorities? may not be the same as your external stakeholders or your uh, parents. So suddenly, competitive salaries and benefits. Do they have access to technology in their daily work? How are their working conditions? What is their staff safety and security like? And again, working in aging facilities as we all sit here in this lovely boardroom, right? <laughs> and then finally, the, the third part that we're going to focus through this survey and, and would be your external stakeholders, which are your community-based partners, are you a retiree, and again, do you have children as one of those groups, and how are we with our transparency? Again, coming back again to customer service, how are we doing with those particular um, priorities? And then, again, very similar budget priorities to what a staff member or a parent would have, your external stakeholder, because they could be the same. Um, so again, academic achievement, uh, recruitment and retention of a diverse, highly qualified workforce. Again, are they interested in smaller class sizes or are they interested in developing partnerships and things like that? So we're going to put this all together where it'll be, if you're not one of these, you can graze right on through. If you're a parent and you want to focus on the parent section, that's the only section you have to answer. Or you might fall into multiple buckets and then we would have those kind of answers available or those kind of questions available for you to answer on. So we're trying to be as comprehensive as possible to get as much information so that as we do move through all these budget discussions, not only with us as a board and administration, but as we move over to the county commissioners and things like that, that we'll have some very good data, I'm hoping, uh, as long as we get a great response rate from our, uh, our community so that we can use this to craft our budget message going forward. So all participants, again, just summarizing here, will have a free form area that they can express whatever they want. The very first part would be more, you know, like the bubbles that you would fill in or, or check boxes or something like that. But we obviously want everybody to be able to state their, their feelings here. Um, and that's what we're going to leave the last section available for. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I had a question. Yes. So this is for staff, parents, and stakeholders. But a lot of the things that you're asking about, like, class sizes and technology and student safety, I feel like a lot of, especially high school students, would have something to say about that. Have Help you, me facilitate getting that out? Uh, have you, yeah, that was my question. Have you thought about giving something to Absolutely, them? Absolutely, we they can, can do that. I appreciate that on. input, and yes, we will make that available. Awesome. Absolutely. That's an excellent idea. But then I come to my question. 
Yes, ma'am. Is it necessarily a good idea to have all of this in one pot? What would be the disadvantage or advantage to separating the staff and doing a staff survey? Same questions that we're going to ask them, but not plunking it in with the parent survey. Um, my, my only they didn't have to go through things they don't have interest or need for be more consolidated I we know it would be the, three surveys well three and that would be surveys. my if, if we had a true survey tool mm -hmm. that we had access to that could accommodate that uh -huh. where then it could take the the data and aggregate it all together and we could certainly look at that in the future that's that's a great point but with I think the tools we have at hand and what's been done in the past we all have it in one central system but we can certainly um, have that discussion going forward. Are you, are, you make, are you making this up on your own, or do we have a... I'll be working with the communications department and, and okay. basically okay. modeling similar to what we had last year yeah, that was out there. Last year. We just want to change it up a little bit and, and make it um, a little more precise as far as the answers, you know, uh, whether, you know, you must fill in one of these or, or none of the aboves and those kind of things, but then still leave there at the end that ability for them to give us some free form comments. So last year we had a lot of open-ended questions and it was quite a bit, I mean, really thousands by the time you got it all said and done with all the questions that were open-ended that took a lot of sifting through right to get because we don't have a program with a, with a company that does surveys so we had to do a lot of work this year we cleaned it up so that most of them were you know multiple choice in some way or on a scale so that they could select there's still an opportunity for some open end but not like it was last year not as much so it will be less cumbersome yep. to compile the results and get them back quickly and, and I think you'll get better data because of it if you did have an, a, a section for like students, parents, staff, community members, um, and they could identify, I'm taking this as a student, like a, a checkbox at the beginning, like what were, what, you, what are you? Are you a student? Or are you a teacher or a parent? Then maybe give an option of does not apply. So if a student is taking it, there might be things that the option of does not apply would, would move them along quicker. Okay. Yeah, because I know we've all taken those online surveys where it says none of the above, and then but if you answer none of the above, please yeah. skip this question 42. Right. We could certainly structure it along that lines. Yes, ma'am. That's a heavy lift for, for you guys. That's what we're here to do. Yeah, I just wonder what the um, cost of a uh, not this year, but maybe about 12,000. We, <laughs> we, yeah. we could do it for about 12,000. 12,000, okay. And of course, that would be available to all other departments to do that. So it's certainly something we can discuss during budget times as well. Yeah, just to get an idea. It's a lot of manual work. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, right. Okay. Anything else? Well, and I also worry that we sometimes, because we do not have very specific software for certain things, it's not only difficult on our staff, it's difficult on our user. They get a little frustrated and they don't even follow through and finish the survey because it's become too cumbersome. So if we're losing data because of that, we're overworking staff because we're trying to make a diamond out of a piece of coal, I guess, then it may very well be feasible to budget dollars for software especially if it's going to allow us to draw data that in the end might generate revenue. Could possibly. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Pister. Thank you. You get the lights. I'll get the lights. At this time, we're on the thing for a break. <laughs> I know this chair is kind of waiting to... <laughs> Moving, on, <laughs> going, Lord. Um, a break. Um, do we want to take a break or do we want to continue on? I'm fine. I don't know if anybody else needs a break. Do you need a break? Okay. Any else? I'm good. Okay, we're going to just keep on moving on then. I think it's me again. Yeah, <laughs> it's you again, your sister. sister. I was just trying to give you a different point of reference rather than <laughs> sitting in front off to the side. Um, 
once again, uh, board members, you, you've been, you have the expenditure report, both the summary and the detail in front of you. Um, and it's for information only, or not information only, it is for information. It does not require any board approval. However, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have um, on the two reports presented uh, in front of you. And this is, again, for the month ending um, October 31st. None? Well, I guess I do ask this, I think I do ask this each year. You're saying that we've spent 83, 83% of our money as of now? Yes. Okay. So we, we aren't very far along. We're at first I'm sorry. Quarter. We're at first quarter in the school yeah, year. Yeah, we're first quarter. And one of the things with all, as I had mentioned, I think, in one of the prior months is, you know, we'll be starting to do an in-depth analysis of these expenditures now that we've got the negotiations, all those things settled out. So we make sure that we're appropriately um, in the position to move forward with the end of the year. But you're right, three quarters of the, I mean, one quarter of the way through the year, and we have, we've spent 83%, but a lot of that is the salaries that are already accounted for okay. as if they were that paid for the whole year. Salaries, got it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Couldn't remember. <laughs> That would be the largest part of that. Yeah. Oh, that's absolutely. That's 86% of our budget. I was yes, say, ma'am. <laughs> there's our 86%. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. What does Mr. Paluski always say? Our business is people. Our business is people. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fister. Thank you. Oh, let's Transportation see. report. Yes, we're seeking for the approval of um, five substitute bus drivers, George Gate, Christina Lopez, Freddie McCracken, David Rice, and Jerry Swartz, who have all met the requirements um, this year. We're also seeking approval for uh, Mr. James Bowser to purchase a new bus to replace bus 3806, whose engine went up um, in that bus. And then Mr. Billy Willis would like to purchase a used spare bus um, that would be a paid spare. We require six buses to be uh, kept as paid spares. They only get a $5,000 um, payment for that each year. That way, in case somebody's bus, is, a bus <coughs> breaks down, they have spares to use. So that is just one to maintain um, for that. So just seeking approval for the five substitutes, Mr. Bowser's purchase of a new bus, um, to replace 3806 and Mr. Billy Willis to purchase a used bus for a paid spare. You know, Mr. Willis is getting this to share for, for others around. Yes. On Ken Island. Basically. Yes. So we require all the LLCs to have six paid spare buses to be used. They have to be 10 years or older. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that it's getting this huge PVA. They're only getting $5,000 and it has to be available to be used by the other contractors in case a bus goes down. What benefit is it to him to maintain another bus, the $5,000? It's Some use it for field trips. I mean, if they have a, you know, it just has to be readily available. Okay. So if they're going on a field trip somewhere, you know, they use that bus um, as an extra one. I make a motion that we approve the transportation report as presented by Mr. Tinder. I second the motion. Any discussions, any questions or discussions regarding the transportation report? Ms. Jackie. Members, please share your response when I call your name. Ms. DiMaggio? Yes. Ms. Stewart? Yes. Ms. Farlow? Yes. Ms. Zaccato? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Yes. I have five any from... We need to go back to the, the HR report. Yeah, we'll skip the HR report. So, Mr. Farley, nine-point... Uh, oh, members of the board, we request that uh, you adopt the HR report as provided. Make a motion that we approve the HR report as presented in closed session. Second. Any questions or discussions? Mrs. Members, Wright? Please share your response if I call your name. Mrs. DiMaggio? Yes. Mrs. George? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mrs. O'Connor? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. They may need to get a refresh on their browser. 
At this time, we move on to the 9.03, the policy for the second and final read. The following policy is presented for approval, policy development, policy number 110 and regulation number 110.1. <clears throat> um, before, um, before I make a motion um, to do that, I would like personally to um, I would like to see us not do any more policies until doing policies here to make a change to do the policies to see what the policy read before and then what the policy read afterwards before we come out here to vote on any more policies. Does that, I sent that to everyone today. Does that make yes. sense? Yes, it does, and I'd like to add to that. Wait a minute, Sharon, put okay. your head up there. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've got it right here. Except okay. we do have policies, what about the policies we don't, that don't exist? We have to, we don't have anything to compare them to. Uh, well, we, no, we like wouldn't have one. any, right, we wouldn't have anything to compare them to, but I think that before we come out here to vote on policies, you know, last month we had a problem with the policies. Um, and I, my personal opinion is that we need to see the policy before we um, come out here to vote on the policy. But, but I mean, we're, that's what we're, pre we're given in our um, agenda, if you read it, read it the weekend before or whenever, right? I mean, I'm not sure what, when they would present it to us. So what we, what we uh, proposed to do in uh, my email is make sure that you have the policy before this board meeting. So the goal was about two weeks, but because we, and we pulled all the other policies off because we wanted you to see the format for the policy development policy. And while the others had not gotten put in that format, we only presented this one, which is the policy development policy in the new format. Right. Right. Which, so that's why all the others, which we, I believe, did we get that to you right, last off, week? Yeah. Right. Yes. yes. Okay. Which <coughs> is this one. We have, we have read this one. But I, I want to make note that I think from future on that the policies need to, the old policy needs to be seen. And if there is no old policy, that's fine. But um, the new policy be seen before we come out to vote before the public. And that's exactly what I proposed. Right. Yeah. But that's not exactly what we have here. On the 28th of September, this policy was posted to our website for review and for, for read. And I have a copy of it. And that version is not reflected in this version in all the strikeouts and the um, the uh, edits and various things. So what I'm saying is this was the policy as of the 28th of September. This is now in its replacement on the policies for discussion tab on our website. This policy, as I've printed it, <coughs> that shows the redlining and the striking out and all of that, is not what this was on the 28th. So when we go from a numbering system to, or a, a lettering system to a numbering system, that needs to be strike out too. That needs to be noted as a change. Everything that we change in this version from the original needs to have a strikeout or a red or a change. You don't just eliminate it, take it away, and said it never existed. Looking at this, this is the way it was with the redlining added. I'm challenging that. This is the way it was when it went out for the second read. And on September 28th, when you forwarded me um, a community input comment, this is the way the policy read, and that doesn't completely match the redlined version 
now. Right. Because on October 10th, when we had that long discussion, I believe it was October 10th, was the board meeting? 17th. Okay, 17th. <clears throat> there, were, there was a lot of discussion, and what I said to you, and what seemed to be acceptable, is that we would take that off, we would put it in the appropriate format, because we talked about it since September, and then on October the 17th, we said we'd put it in the appropriate format. It wasn't any point in putting the wrong format back up there. So we put the real format, let you know what protocol we'd be following so that you could see that that was an acceptable one. And I think what Annette is trying to get to is we should still have a record of the prior version. So it should go out for first read, comments come in, we make changes, we do red lines, we do strikeouts. That original version should always stay in place. This is it as our second version with our first set of strikeouts, first set of edits, first set of changes out now again for second read. We should always have both of those versions in front of us when we are looking at what's being asked to approve as a final. So we can see the progression of the changes from the conception to the final not just do away with those changes as if they never existed because looking at this it looks like this is the only thing that changed or this is the only thing that changed um, strikeouts are the only thing that got moved or adjusted to another category actually those are not the only thing that changed from the 28th so changed? i think that was confusing what else well thought, our numbering system changed right, i'm not mm -hmm. sure how we mm -hmm. and um <coughs> so there's just this is just this is numbering. work session stuff and i think that's what we need to start thinking about doing policies in a work session that's where what, we can that's sit exactly down that's exactly where we can going get the that, yeah. current version with the red lines and the adjustments and the comments the comments should always be printed i actually have the comments because dr kane had forwarded them to me on the 28th but without those to look at as a guide or an offer it's just an offer of suggestion from whoever makes these comments they might not even be valid but we need to see the comments and read them and be aware of them and I think we discussed that in the 17th meeting that we should get a copy of the comments and be notified about them and that everything was going to have a draft watermark on it prior to final approval um, there's just a lot of things we talked about that haven't quite gotten through the process. So one and thing we've done, Ms. Harlow, is adopt um, uh, editing conventions <coughs> that are driving our numbering system, which is different, as you've pointed out. But you've been invited to, and I believe have accepted, have. Uh, that invitation on the 16th of November for a policy committee. That policy committee's role is in part to review documents before they come to the board. And I'm wondering whether you can see an opportunity for us to craft a process that's responsive to your needs and still meets the needs of our stakeholder groups. Absolutely. Um, I think that's the goal. That's our and, goal, too. And until our policy development policy reflects that well, <clears throat> I don't think we should approve it at this point. First of all, there's still typos and those various things and formatting issues. But I would like to talk about how we ensure we have the very original version and the transpiration through the changes all documented and not, not done away with. I actually have a very serious question about our ethics um, policy, too. As does someone uh, who commented. Uh, well, I don't know. I didn't see that. But the version used, the version used to produce the new version that's out for discussion on the web page, how do we, um, when, when those versions aren't kept together, as a flow, we can't ever go back and find them. Well, I think you make an excellent point that people's concerns and transparency are important. So perhaps this is something we can address at the work session. I'm sorry that I'm not real <laughs> clear in how to portray what I'm trying to get the point across about. Well, we can all get clear together. It's a real 
When is that meeting? Important step to have of each November. documented version Before the and work session. trail. Okay. 16th? So, that being said. Any more discussion? So, we want that before we even move forward with this one. That's what you're, you're recommending. Um, that's what I recommended. Yes, I believe so. Um, well, I don't think we're there. Ready? Because we're not. We're not, not approving it. We're sending out for a second read. Approval no. comes at the next meeting. Final. I thought no. there was no. only two reads. <clears throat> That's changed in the, this policy. But this policy is, is under the, the old. Oh. Yeah. Before we ask, because you've right. not approved this, so this is under its current policy, and that required maybe that this would help be if we the second. It, maybe it, we should be sending it out. And well, again. what what was That's this what for? This one proposes right right mm -hmm. was this was proposing the second read no this is under the current which says this would be the second and final so we would be seeking approval today right we revised that to give uh, uh from one board meeting to another for the first read then another that second board meeting to the third for the second read and then at the third board meeting seek approval so that gives you know a period of time almost 30 days between each of the reads so it gives more time for folks to take a look at it and just to add to that how important it is to keep each one of those and this is your first version <coughs> this was the fine um the the first read these are the comments you had on your first read and these are the changes we made as a committee or based on a comment from a community member or someone within our staff noticed a whole section missing whatever the reason is then your second version, reflecting those changes, additions, whatever have you, still to be compared to the first one, because that's what you're looking at. What did we change from the first one to the second one? Making sure you didn't lose a sentence or a category or a whole section. If you don't have the first one to look at and you're into the second one, you don't know what and to, and to be clear yeah. that is absolutely the process but for this one we did not there's no content change from october 17th we like i said we changed the format there's no content change from october I guess 17th so my I'm question for this Sharon, Sharon, Sharon um, is mm -hmm. um, is that we they need this particular one i think to move forward we on do the other ones. we do so that's I don't why we have a that. problem yeah. i read this whole thing right. content wise i don't have a problem with it i don't know what the value would be to start over on this or give us another day on this one well i, I guess i would ask why would we approve a final version that still needs edits and oh, still needs it improvement still need yes oh, yes okay, we're, we're looking at it um well here it is If we approve this, they're just going to go in there and accept the red lines and remove the strikeouts and the document's going to stand, correct? New language is red. And strikeouts will disappear. New language will turn from red to black, from capital letters to, to correct. To to mm -hmm. At what point do we um, address typos or is something there, of if, that sort? If, if, yeah, there's, well, if there's a right typo. Here. I mean, it's the very it's first not, thing, well, it's but not it's a typo. still, it's the way, it's but, the it, way the, but it's it shows up when still, we put things in PDF. It's what we've put up as we are approving this. Yeah. And I wonder if you have, because we did go back and try to re get that E back up there. Well, so see, it's, it's here a, too. It, it happens down here too. Electronically and, 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 right. It's up there now. So yep. Ms. Harlow has if, an old one. She doesn't have the now. Now, where one. is that in our docs? It's on your board docs right now. But that's what I'm saying. This is well. I don't know if I printed this from board docs, or if I no, I could have print. It's sitting on the website they're as the lead too. They're, they're linked. They're so linked. they're the same one. Mm -hmm. Well, then when did that get um, corrected? When did that change? Because probably either yesterday, Friday, or something. Okay, mm -hmm. so almost we have to check it yeah, the so you, hour so before we come so here. So you've got to, if you, if you pull up your board docs, you I will I don't say, know what date I printed this, so I just know what you date I printed when, this. Do you remember when we did budget and we couldn't send you certain graphs on this board yes. docs because when you put it in PDF, it changes the format? It's the same issue. Okay, okay. Well, the last paragraph. 
We're, we're listening. I'm sorry. Yes, do you I do. Remember get, that? I do. I do. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, you know, I if just you really think I would recommend if you yeah, just like yeah, about it. yeah, another, yeah, definitely another read. Let's yes. not approve it today. Yeah. Because I think if we get, get through the straight. struggles of this right. particular document mm -hmm. and the way we move forward, mm -hmm. it's going to make our work easier with every policy to follow. And but you will see that we, we have proposed that. Yes, you just yes. need some more time well, to take a look at it. Well, we need to talk about yeah. how all of this okay. happened. Because, because like. The original document's gone. It's gone. It's it's not gone. You, well, it's I mean, gone. It's it's still available. But we if you where? if you need where would I it's, find it? We we took it off when we changed the format, just like we said in the October meeting, because there was so much discussion. And I, think that and I needs said to be that's a part of, what a part of the discussion too. A that's part what we of were going to do. How we archive our changes and was, all that. But anyway, yeah. yeah. Well, I recommend Miss well, um, DiMaggio that we um, move. Uh, move this to another read and then we can resolve these issues. Right, exactly. In the okay. work session. Great Thank idea. You. Um, so do you want to do, do you want to do the, um, the vote to, because I no. think we're just going so to move it to a work session. Right. Okay. All right. And that will give us the time so to we'll have our meeting. To the work session. Okay. And we will have a committee meeting next week before that, meeting. Before that work session. I was getting ready to say, and that'll uh, work out perfect. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And Carrie and I are committed to that meeting on okay. the 16th. All right, so now we're going to move on to 9.04 new courses. I don't even know what this is. They're, they're art classes, they're new in language, art and language classes. They're adding. Uh, Madam Superintendent, the recommendation uh, that we're making on behalf of the superintendent is for the following nine visual art courses uh, to be approved by the board. Uh, upon uh, Mr. Bell's arrival, our new visual and performing arts, uh, the restructuring uh, or addition of these courses is to had, add additional pathways for uh, advanced placement in studio. You'll see in, in studio um, 2D um, as well as 3D. And certainly if there are more specific questions around visual art, Mr. Mr. Bell is here to answer any of those questions. Um, Who and teaches these classes? The the art teachers. Correct. These are these are just these are high school. I don't quite school. understand what this is. So <coughs> I can you kind of like tell me what it is? Sure, and I'll have Mr. Bell come up here as well. One of the things that we're in the process of doing is restructuring our sequence of courses in visual arts at the high school level. Part of which is to add additional advanced placement courses and courses that lead to that. And, and I'll, new I'll leave have it to come before the board. So correct. that's why you're seeing it. And that's and, and to Dr. Kane's point, any time that we offer a new course of study, by law we're required to present that to the board for the board's approval so that when we put it in our high school program of study, which we're working on right now for 19 and 20, then these courses can be in there, their course descriptions. We can have articulation with our high school and our middle school folks so that they know in planning for the coming year, these courses would be offered for students to take. But we would also have to hire staff or we have staff. We, we have current staff, and we'd have to write curriculum uh, as a result of that. But I'm going to leave it up to our resident expert who, uh, who's taught all of these courses as a, as a teaching professional. Good evening, members of the board, and uh, also thank you for your service, President, Vice President, Dr. Kane, Mr. Paluski. Uh, the, these aren't additional courses. Uh, it, just to make it clear, it's a revamping of the visual arts curriculum so that it actually for the first time in our county's history provides a scope and scaffolded sequence with honors level more rigorous courses that all lead to AP. Now students can still jump around and take courses in 2D which is essentially your drawing and painting classes or courses in 3D which is essentially your ceramics <coughs> and your sculpture classes. But this way, 
they actually have the opportunity for the very first time to be college and career ready in visual arts and have the opportunity, like many other districts, to take AP Studio Art drawing 2D as well as 3D. So it's, it's really exciting and uh, we've been working hard with our visual arts teachers uh, as well as the school counselors to make them aware that these changes are changes that we've been working on and we're answering the community's call from that survey that wanted more engagement in the arts. So, so we're you, enhancing them and in, in, enriching them and offering them better opportunities absolutely. or more opportunities with no cost involvement? No, no cost involvement wow. whatsoever. Even materials? No. But, okay. Is this actually a pathway? I was going to say, to this is a pathway. It, it, is, a, it is a pathway. <laughs> and it, it is in line with the current pathway that's that there. Right. E exactly. Yeah, I, I, so yeah. let me just that? to be clear, as we write curriculum, we will need to pay those teachers who are writing curriculum for the courses. But we don't we need do to that hire a, new teachers. On an ongoing but, basis right, exactly. anyway, as curriculum needs exactly. change or advance and mm -hmm. increase. Yep. So that's not like scare the community right. oh we need all this stuff no i think that's what i was no this is a this with. is a this is a great thing and it really brings our curriculum forward into the 21st century i was gonna say that it, it really does it, world it is of visual arts as opposed to what we thought of arts 20 years ago or 15 or even 10. well and it it, it gives these students an opportunity now if they do choose a track say say they're more geared towards ceramics and sculpture then this way they can lead on a, on a pathway where they're going to get better and better and better and lead it into AP 3D, which is a opportunity for them to get college credit while in high school. Well, yeah, there and are have an amazing people who portfolio. Go to college on an art scholarship. Absolutely. I mean, it does exist. Okay. okay. So you've written this as new courses, so we're not really approving new courses. These are new courses. These are all new courses that they're, they're going to require new curriculum for. But the current courses that are out there right now, for instance, watercolor, life drawing, they're all things that can be taught within the confines of a 2D studio track, just like ceramics can all be taught still under the confines of 3D. We just open it up so they could also Water do sculpture. They could also do other, other things. So it broadens the horizons a little bit. So like so AP Calc and like AP Stat, will there be um, an AP test at the end that they have to pay for and pass <coughs> for the college credit? Th there is. That's a great question, and but it's very different. Uh, the AP Studio Art 2D, AP Studio Art Drawing, and 3D are all portfolio submissions. So the exam happens in the spring, but it's a culmination of an experience and a portfolio where they have 12 breath works that happen during that portfolio class in the fall and then 12 concentration works that is pretty much like your solo show. If you've ever been to a gallery where you have an artist that has a solo exhibition, yeah. it's their solo show, those concentration pieces. So they submit that portfolio digitally through their teacher, and you know they have the opportunity to get that college credit early. That's awesome. Good question, Wonderful. Mario. Thank you. Great question. And, and then I just want to follow up. So, and the, in, the languages, they're an additional class we aren't offering at this time. We don't offer French Honors 3 and Spanish Honors 3. That's correct. And, and what happened in order to make that opportunity possible, reaching out to the World Language Department chairs, they expressed to us that level five really wasn't being used. It was being collapsed and level four and fives were combined. Right. We got rid of level, f we're going to get rid of level five so that we can offer a more rigorous level, level three, three for students who want to be fluent faster. Okay. Okay. I do. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Oh, I had just one question. The yes. um, teachers that are being tasked with um, maybe incorporating this into their their day, their work day, um, is this what is the workload going to be on them? My concern would just be that they would be overwhelmed. Is is there any notion of that? When no, it's adding? it's not an increased workload on them. It. At, at the AP level, it, it is an increased rigor for the students, definitely. But th that'll be for your serious students that if they want to attend art school one day, now they'll be able to compete with other di neighboring districts that have AP already and have had it for over two decades in some cases. So they'll be able to compete now. But no, it's not going to require that. It will require AP training and 
we're in the process of writing grants and able to secure those funds to send those teachers on the AP training. And I was also an AP teacher myself, so I can provide on the spot training with no problem. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And I don't know if this question was asked. I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, was there, I know you asked about cost. Is there any kind of cost with the materials that may be needed for some of these more advanced art classes? No, and but we are getting really creative. We had a great discussion with all the uh, art teachers at the high school level at both ends of the county on Monday night uh, about some fundraising ideas and some ways that they can capitalize on expanding the spotlight on their their own programs and we've been shining a, a light since um, we started on the great things that they're doing we just had a statewide winner it took first place out of all districts which was awesome and it made front page of the paper so we're definitely sh shedding a spotlight on the arts and trying to bring all the great work that these teachers are doing to the forefront so I'll help them with that <laughs> thank you sure all right well I guess at this time we're going to vote you might have a motion to approve the following new courses so moved. second any questions we probably need to read them. Uh -huh. Do we need to read them Why? each one. Why? Well, I don't know. We should read them. Yeah. yeah. Visual Art 2D Studio Art 1, 2D Studio Art 2, 2D Portfolio Development Honors, AP Studio Art 2D Design, AP Studio Art Drawing, 3D Studio Art 1, 3D Studio Studio Art 2, 3D Portfolio Portfolio Development Honors, AP Studio Art 3D Design, French 3 Honors, Spanish 3 Honors. Any questions regarding the new courses? Mrs. Wright? Well, I'm going to this line when I call your name. Mrs. DiMaggio? Yes. Mrs. George? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Connor? Yes. Thank you. I have five of you for Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Bell. you, and thank you again for your service. Okay. Thank you. Um, now we have we move on to 9.05 field trips. <clears throat> May I have a motion to approve the following field trips? Ken Allen High School cheer team to reach the beach tournament in Ocean City, Maryland, February 23rd through February 24th, 2019. Ken Allen High School varsity cheer team to Dallas, Texas for national championships, January 25th. 2019 uh, through January 28, 2019. I have a question about that. Um, who is funding that? Or the, the uh, is the cheerleading team itself funding the, the uh, field trip to are. Dallas? Well, I believe the cost was like $800 a student or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm, I want to know who's funding it. Oh. If they're paying for it, or right. if we, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Let me go get my paperwork off my desk. <laughs> I thought I had it in this file, and I do not. Hang on, this, sorry. This is a first request for for that, isn't it? Yeah, for that, yeah. Yeah, for both of them, actually. Mm -hmm. But I think the board uh, should know I think they go to the it. Reach the Beach every year. I just think that um, the, state, the national, championship. national championships. That's a big deal. They've been they've to Maryland State They've qualified for it. And yeah. Five, yeah. Four, this is four They years always go to the states, but this is the first time they've right. been qualified for nationals, right? No, I, I think, I don't know. I, really uh, I just uh, want to know I who's know. funding they won it. The state four years in a row. And they're well, moving they, they, they have a note that they um, have fundraisers cooler. planned. Because the board's not. That's what parents are driving, and the parents mm -hmm. are driving. And this one, I'm going to take. They're driving to Texas. Is that what you said? <laughs> Looking at oh. holy cow. Uh, well, one of these they are. Let me see. It's probably Seriously. the beach one. That's a long drive. That's what I said. I drive to Florida. It's the Three Ocean days. City. I'm looking at yeah. the Ocean yeah, it's, City. It says yeah, flying from BWI to Dallas. What's that? It, yeah. it, it, there, it, it's out, within the notes the that they'll be flying to Dallas. <laughs> oh, okay. It's not, different. not driving. There's two different I'm looking at Ocean City. Yeah, it was the Ocean City that we <laughs> <laughs> Okay, because I was like, driving to Texas and they're only going to be there for three days is kind of crazy. It takes me 17 hours to get to Panama City. I would hate to see how long it takes to get to Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Three bus companies, they are driving, have, have given a bid. 
the Dallas trip? Yes. Mm. Greg, where did you read just gonna out of BWI? Uh, it's on the second. And they're doing fundraisers, it says. It's on page form. two, yeah. Typically, they would be fundraising for any kind of local fund. Yeah. On the, on the email for October 26, it talks See, about. See, that's crazy. That distance, I gotta fly. I gotta get it there. It talks about airfare, hotel, and um, the fees for competition. I just worry if they fell short on their funding, are they gonna come to us for. I didn't see her there. Board members, I went back and found, you might have the copy up there, but yes, the funding sources are SNAP fundraiser, Winter Bazaar fundraiser, and proceeds from the little buck game. <laughs> the what? Could you demonstrate that for us, Mr. Penn? <laughs> 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 I'm just reading what was written, no comment. <laughs> that appears as fundraisers would be cover the cost. Okay. So the, the Board of Education is not funding it? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Oh, here we go. Many parent plan fundraisers uh, committing already planning. They're already com committed to pl all planning events. Okay. So do we Good for them. I just, I, and I'm, you know, I'm just, we've oh, had sure. many other groups come before us yeah. for money and we don't fund them. And I just don't want to have one group be singled out and we fund that. So that, that's why I asked. Just clarification. So I don't have a, I don't have a problem otherwise with it. So I actually didn't know that our cheerleaders went and competed. I just, I, I really didn't. Oh, this yeah. is, this is what brought oh, it to yeah. my light that our cheerleaders compete. I thought. Big deal. It's I a big they deal. just came to the school event. They have college scholarships for it, too. Yeah. yeah. Ken Island High School has <laughs> Ken Island won it yes, yeah. the state championships for a couple of years in a row. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. I had no they, idea. They, yeah, it's huge. They always have snippets on the announcements from their competitions over the weekend. So if you go to, like, Ken Island Buck Report on YouTube, you can watch. Great. All right. So, All right, so we'll move on, and now we have to, have to I think I've already said it, so may I have a motion? Second. You, Any, I, didn't I say them all? I move that we approve the two field trips for the Ken Island High School cheerleading squad. Second. Second. Any questions or discussions? <laughs> Mrs. Wright? Mrs. DiMaggio? Yes. Mrs. George? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mrs. O'Connor? Yes. Thank you, Bobby. That's a fun trip. Good one. At this um, time, we move on to citizen public comment. Do we have anyone that um, has not spoke who would like to speak at this time? Okay, go. Okay, so now we will move on to future meetings and events. Uh, November 13th will be the dedication of the new wing at Graysonville Elementary School at 5 p.m. Uh, for Bishop Arlene Taylor. We invite everyone to come out. November 19th is a Monday. We will, be we will be having a school board work session from 11 to 2 p.m. Uh, the visual and performing arts reception has been moved to the spring of 2019. The date will be announced at, uh, yeah. later. I think, um, what, or that's what you told me because I asked what time oh, it was. I'm, I'm sorry. I have the, the work session is 2 to 4. It's 11 no, to No, we don't ever do 2 okay. to 4. Then that's my mistake. So it's 11 yeah. to? 11 to 2, yeah. Um, December 5th, new board member oath of office at 4.30 p.m. here. School board meeting will begin at 6. Uh, December 7th is the Centerville Christmas Parade. December 19th is the school board work session. January 9th, school board meeting. January 16th, school board work session. January 22nd, school board retreat. I think we canceled that for now. We put that on no, hold. Well, it was... It was canceled on the for 21st. the 21st, and now it's down for the 22nd. Yeah. So we've decided to postpone. Postpone. That. All right. Postpone. So the school the board spring. retreat for January 22nd is off of the calendar till a future date. January 30th is the school board budget work session. February 6th is the superintendent's recommended budget. February 13th is the school board budget work session. February 20th is the school board work session. 
Any questions? Anybody want to add anything? Yes. So on behalf of my executive team, myself and my executive team, we'd like to congratulate Ms. Carey. We've done that by email today, but we'd like to congratulate you face-to-face. -face. Well done. And also to thank Ms. DiMaggio and Ms. George for their service over the last four years. It's not always been rosy, but you've gotten some incredible work done. So thank you for your service. Thank you. At this time, we will adjourn for the last time, Ms. George. Go into no, we're going session. into closed session. I know, but open session. Last Wednesday night meeting. <laughs> <laughs> True that. <laughs> um, so at this time, we move. I need a motion to go into closed, back into closed session. Right? We go into closed session. Second. We have to say what for um, Personnel, oh, do you have it? Yeah. Sharon has it. She's got it in that grocery hey. bag. Yeah. <laughs> you carry everything in that grocery bag? <laughs> I move we go into closed session to consider matters that relate to negotiations to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, and officials over whom this body has jurisdiction to, form an ad to perform an administrative function and to consult with council. Okay, I need a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Farewell.